Season 18, episode 34, I believe. Hard to believe that we are at uh, 34 episodes for uh, season 18, Cognitive Mechanics. It's been a long time, it's been a long haul. Does that literally like mean we have like 34 months worth of, uh, of episodes in? That's insane, if you think about it, it's a lot. So yeah. Glad to have it. Glad to have uh, that much content, especially on top of the Cutting Edge podcast, as well as everything else that we have behind the paywall. Thank you all for uh, your monetary contribution. Also, I'm happy or uh, sad to report that my tripod broke, so uh, kind of stuck. Filming live on a bench for the moment, so I can get this uh, tripod uh, fixed or well, it's not going to be fixed. It's going to be thrown into the dumpster, honestly. I was really disappointed that it fell apart so easily. I had just replaced this one, too, so it's, like, kind of even worse. So, yeah. All right, so let's get in down to the details. We've been discussing the octogram, specifically defining what the four variants of the octogram actually are. And uh, today we're going to be discussing my variant of octogram, which is kind of cool if you think about it. My variant. So maybe I'll be adding a little bit extra because we're going to be talking about me today. So yeah. Welcome to the show, Mr. J. Welcome to the show. So interesting how like no one actually shows up for these uh, live streams, but then like the recordings are pretty well watched by the journeyman. So it's just it's always so fascinating to me. But yeah. So octogram. Remember, we came up with octogram to kind of explain, use it as a tool to explain human nurture, which has been something that's entirely important. Before, people were relying on the Enneagram, and the Enneagram is flawed because it mixes nature with nurture and thinks it's all a, a totally complete system, when in reality it's not a complete system by any means, not even remotely, not a complete system. So, and at times, uh, people uh, end up struggling, you know, from that perspective. And they combine it with MBTI, and then they end up just ruining their lives because they end up making life decisions, especially women, off of uh, these corrupt or inaccurate systems, which just ends up making life for everybody else insanely worse. I mean, I remember a time where Railgun, for example, wouldn't make a single decision based on, uh, would like make no decision unless, like, it kind of matched with her horoscope to a point. And I'm like, no, as cool as the Zodiac is, it's still an incomplete or an inaccurate system because it's incomplete. There's, you know, my main theory is that there's still four signs uh, of the Zodiac still missing from uh, our 12 sign system. But we can't do that until we uh, invent faster than light travel to be able to figure out what that actually means and how that actually works. Not only that, the Zodiac calendar has been like changed on multiple occasions and recalculated. So oftentimes people are making decisions based on old calendar or new calendar. And it's, I don't know, it's just kind of nuts. And to be fair, I'm not an expert on the Zodiac. I don't pretend to be. So take everything I say on the Zodiac with a grain of salt. I just know that I often have to compete with it from a Jungian analytical psychology perspective, which is in its own right um, annoying. So thank you, Mr. Fib, for handling that. Uh, let's uh, discuss uh, the issues that I was having with the interface later. So anyway, so the octogram. We know that the octogram discerns four variants for each type. 
These four variants are the different shades and flavors of each type. There are layers that determine Octogram influence beneath what is easily visible. Octogram deals with development and focus. Cognitive development and cognitive focus exists on a tempo level, a four sides level, and an individual function level. A person's Octogram reveals their preference for which temple, which side of the mind, and yes, even which functions they prefer. If you want to learn more about functional precision in terms of identifying which functions are hyperdeveloped versus which functions are underdeveloped, check out the Ego Hacking Your Fear Masterclass. If you do not have Ego Hacking Your Fear, you can uh, go check that out at egohackingyourfear.com. If you already have the course but don't have the masterclass, go to offers.csjoseph.life forward slash EYF hyphen masterclass and you'll get that. All right. So make sure you guys do that. Remember the four octogram variants are linked to Strauss and Howe theory. <clears throat> Strauss and Howe theory talks about summertime, which is SDSF. Then you have the fall, which is decay, which is SDUF. And then you have winter, which is UDUF, also known as despair. And then you have springtime, which is UDSF, which is specifically what we're going to be discussing today, hope springs eternal. Spring is everything. Muchly. Muchly everything. So, a lot of people are like, oh my God, what the hell is this guy doing on a park bench? I really don't give a shit. Okay. Hello, Stephanie. Avery, I was surprised to read this references to Christ and being born under a Pisces sun and Libra moon, most likely. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot to it. There's actually, um, back in 2017, there was a huge star alignment from like Revelation. 2018 from Revelation chapter 17 actually uh, a prophesied uh, star alignment and that star alignment actually occurred it was uh, very fascinating uh, it's about like you know the, the serpent about to eat Virgo's child and whatnot so it's kind of it's kind of kind of weird it kind of makes you like lean into Bart Ehrman's teaching when when considering Christianity just a little bit I wonder I wonder what Islam's uh, position on the zodiac is I should probably look into that I should probably should actually so anyway uh, <clears throat> so that being said uh, remember, folks, you know, when you're unconscious developed, I mean, unconscious development is like a little bit different from subconscious development. Unconscious developed people do not really have great childhood. And uh, John Bodine, uh, who helped uh, prepare this lecture, he wanted to, he contacted me recently and added a very important point about uh, SD or uh, about UDSF types, which I'm going to share, which I found very poignant. Uh, I was very, uh, very excited uh, that uh, he came up with a concept because I find it entirely, uh, entirely accurate. So, you know, I think I might even do another live stream right after this one, except while on a longboard at the same time. That'd get really interesting. I like doing many things at the same time. Live streaming, butterflying, and longboarding at the same time. You think I can do all three? I think I can. I think I can. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Although I was kind of upset that my trainer basically is worthless. <laughs> I beat it up too much. <laughs> beat it up way too much. All right. So what? What exactly is UDSF? So we know that it is um, spring energy, and you know uh, the dream of spring, according to George R. R. Martin, or hope springs eternal. Right? It's at that spring energy. UDSF may have been a former UDUF type, and that's basically what happened to me. Some UDSF were that way from childhood, and others were more fragile in their UDSF, having just emerged recently from UDUF in their adulthood or even older age. And that's me. Like, I have to actually make a conscious choice every single day to not be outwardly envious with my deadly sin and not allow other people to pull or allow myself to push my uh, envy onto other people and instead work very hard to become the envy, basically. 
And that's a conscious choice that I have to make every single day. Although sometimes I will admit that I am in the presence of people that put me into unconscious focus sometimes. Uh, like for example, Railgun does that consistently. She puts me in my unconscious focus on a regular basis because sometimes I find myself just trying to endure her instead of actually like enjoying her. At least that's how it's been like for, you know, for years. And now that we're divorced, it's like, you know, it's still, it's still there. Those neural pathways are still there. But there is an advantage though. There's an advantage to having been UDUF and then all of a sudden you are UDSF now and you still have access to all of your UDUF survival capabilities. You have access to all of those, uh, to all of those uh, neural pathways. And you notice like when you're dealing with people who are UDUF and have become UDSF, or if they're, you know, if they, if it's taken a lot longer for them to get into subconscious focus, you know, like for example, here's a comparison. Take a, an adolescent, right? They were UD, uh, they were basically UDUF, and then they hit adolescence. They finally got away from their family. They're kind of on their own, and they finally achieved their subconscious focus because all the sources of their life that were putting them into that mode are basically gone, right? They're basically gone. So. Once that happened, they've been subconscious focused a lot longer. So they have less access to the unconscious focused neural pathways. Whereas someone like me, who was UDUF the majority of their life and consistently UDUF the majority of their life. What that ends up doing, what, that, what ends up happening is that I end up having more access to unconscious focused neural pathways but it's also a lot more difficult for me to maintain the state of subconscious focus compared to someone who's been subconscious focused for a very long time. And that right there could actually point to another layer of subvariance within the octogram itself, another sublayer. And we've also been talking a lot about wings recently in the same way that Enneagram wings, uh, we're gonna be discussing wings of the octogram uh, for season 18 in the very near future, and that's gonna be uh, something entirely new uh, for you folks, so I'm sure you'll uh, hell enjoy that when that comes. So yeah, the UDSF unconscious develops subconscious focus is characterized as the hope or spring archetype. UDSF octograms are the proverbial emerging from the cave types who were once caught in extreme adversity, perhaps trauma, depression, and or disablement, but found their way through the darkness, pulled by the light at the end of the tunnel. The UDSF octograms run on hope. They understand that even when they are alone. They can still self-generate some of what they need to survive. Both unconscious developed variants tend to be the most self-sufficient of all the types. This octogram's fuel is ultimately hope. They run on hope, they live on hope, and they die without hope. They also tend to, to struggle when there is nothing to overcome, or no challenge to sharpen themselves on. They're used to having to, they're, they are used to having to overcome and their hope is sharpened most when in the midst of a challenge. Oftentimes I talk about how crusader types would feel like something's wrong if uh, they feel like something's wrong if there wasn't any adversity to face. But after knowing some crusaders who are SDSF, while that is somewhat true it still exposes like a Pareto principle bias because I'm UDSF and as a UDSF heart crusader it's way worse for me in terms of expecting adversity because I do expect adversity to the point where I'm way sense I'm way more sensitive to there not being adversity in my life to there not being drama in my life to there not being problems or obstacles to overcome in my life compared to another heart crusader who is SDSF, for example. Which I find entirely fascinating, if you think about it. So, yeah. Let's not start a fire here, that would be bad. The UDSF archetype is thematically the pole of opportunity. They didn't have as much opportunity in their childhood environment, but now that they are free, and now that they have escaped the pit, it's time for their hope to be realized through the abilities they've gained from what they've endured. But don't forget, unconscious development 
makes a person far wiser than a subconscious developed person. And that's why subconscious developed people like being around UD people because of this, uh, there's a need for wisdom, you know, whereas unconscious developed people like being around subconscious developed uh, people because of their need for joy, joy in their life, right? It's this exchange of joy and wisdom. However, one thing I have noticed is that for some reason in sexual relationships, oftentimes there's a little bit of camaraderie there when it comes to uh, development, subconscious development or unconscious development, because having a similar development, having double the joy and double the, double the wisdom, it seems like they end up actually enabling each other from that perspective, because it's like, oh, you're wise about the things I'm missing. Oh, you're, you're joyful about the things I'm missing. And it's like they end up working together to discover joy. If you have two UD types together, or if you have two SD types together, they work together to discover wisdom together. Sure, when you look at cognitive origins and how things are exchanged, that's definitely important, you know. But at the same time, if you're gonna look at just the base level octogram variance as presented within the context of uh, you know, within the context of the variants, the four variants just themselves. From that point of view, you find yourself uh, in a situation where you find yourself in a situation where it's like, okay, well, it's kind of nice to have somebody to discover joy with. It's kind of nice to to have somebody to discover wisdom with. So it's. It's kind of fascinating how there's always these backups, these little controls uh, within the human mind that's based on our genetics as well as our epigenetic expression to be able to facilitate human relationships. And the octogram is no different. And that's not something that we've really discussed before when it comes to octogram compatibility, which we will be going into pretty deep in the very near future. Now, you know, each of the four variants has like a preference, you know, for the temples. So for example, the SDUF octogram, the UDSF octogram is spread across three different temples. They have their ego temple, but have developed into their shadow temple and aspire to their subconscious temple. UDSF body temple types, ENTJ, INTP, ESFJ, ISFP, are used to relying on the learning of the mind temple shadow was now pull, push into the heart temple subconscious with a focus on what stirs their heart and infuses their life with conviction and meaning. UDSF mind temple types, for example, ESTJ, ISTP, ENFJ, INFP, are used to relying on their body temple shadow, but can now journey into the soul temple subconscious, focusing on character, integrity, and identity, theirs and others, as a means to ultimately come to a higher level of understanding. UDSF heart temple types, like myself, yours truly, ENTP, INTJ, ESFP, ISFJ, are used to relying on the justification and, and identity in their soul temple, shadows, but can now journey into the body temple subconscious, where their achievement and legacy becomes an extension of their passion. Why do you think I'm doing what I'm doing? I remember being in a relationship with Kim, the ENFJ, a woman that I love dearly. And I still care a great deal about her, but she can't be in my life anymore, not after what she did to me personally, and put me in danger physically and put my uh, business in danger. But throughout my relationship with her, I was UDUF actually. And uh, then like when I had her move out before we broke up, uh, we ended up becoming uh, more, uh, how shall we say, like I ended up having a little bit more hope and then as I started my YouTube channel, which gave me a source of hope, I was really working on my legacy, mostly because like I was dying at that moment. And as a result of, uh, you know, just attempting to upload my brain to the internet because I was about to die in those days and then as a result of that, 
it got to a point where it's like, okay, I, I can have a little bit of hope because I'm leaving a legacy behind. But I'm still working and building on that legacy now as a UDSF ENTP. Not unlike what Andrew Tate was doing, because he's a UDSF ENTP as well. And it's so interesting, you just look at him and you look at me and realize that there's a huge correlation in our behavior and our uh, belief systems. But the reality of the situation is, is that we're not the same person. But, you know, I get wrongly accused of doing things all the time as much as he does. For example, actually just the other night, I was in the park just over there and I was practicing my butterfly uh, trainer. I was stopped by some INTJ girl named Sierra on the street or whatever. And uh, she had her friend Ty and her friend Bella uh, with her. Ty was a, uh, an FI hero, Bella was an FE hero. Although visually Bella kind of looked, I mean, I, I want to say he's an ISFP and she's an ESFJ. But we all got to talk and they had me show some of my butterfly tricks, whereas like I'm nothing compared to Fib, the person who's training me on it. But, uh, you know, I, I know a couple of tricks I showed them and they're happy about it or whatever. But this INTJ kept on asking me for my Instagram like over and over and over. It got to the point where like she was like really, really demanding. And I just, I was just disgusted by how demanding this, this girl was. I, and she was a girl. Like she had to have been like 18 or 19 at least. Definitely still a teenager. And uh, her friends were all 18, so I'm assuming she's 18, but she wouldn't admit where her age was, but they did. And uh, she kept on trying to force my Instagram out of me, and I was like, no. You know, and I said, you gotta, like, I have to, like, get to know you a little bit more before I do that. You gotta be on the show. You know, we gotta do the show, right? She didn't want to be on the show, she's doing that stupid INTJ paranoia crap that they do. Just really annoying expert intuition nemesis. It's just like, okay. Especially since like, I know that the audience really, really, really wants to see an INTJ on the show. So I was pushing for that. <coughs> but she wasn't gonna have it. And my SE demon was like, okay. And then she started like mocking me over it and then like mocking my SI inferior. And then I'm like, okay, okay, so if you're making me uncomfortable, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable right now. So I just started like going after her SE inferior hard. Started mocking her, started making fun of her because I just ultimately felt justified to do so at that point. She got super butt hurt. So then I ended up giving my number to her friend Ty because Ty's like, hey man, you're, you're a guy I'd like really like to get to know. And I'm like, awesome, here's my number, contact me, you know? And then Sierra, she's like, why don't you give me uh, you know, your Instagram, I'm like, nope. And now Ty has got my number, so you can get my number from him and then you can text me when you're ready. That ain't gonna happen. And I don't care if it happens either. She was really rude and forcing outcomes and being entirely emasculating. And you can tell she expects everything to be served up on a silver platter to her. She's also probably one of the most shallow INTJs I've ever met. Extremely shallow very very shallow and i'm just like i just don't have patience for that at all especially you know you know me being a udsf entp a ud entp is extremely uh cringe and intimidating and a terrifying individual and that's a fact you know i i am pretty terrifying here i am this guy walking around in public flipping a butterfly knife trainer people freak out assume it's a knife or whatever everyone jumps to conclusions and blah 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 so anyway, there were some people that were walking by as I was demonstrating my knife tricks to these three kids. And then like, they didn't even stop to like figure out what we we're talking about or nothing. They just jumped to judgment. So then they called the cops on me or whatever. I didn't know they called the cops on me. I found out later. So I ended up leaving that group of teenagers, going along my business for the evening and working on uh, my, you know, working on my tricks as I normally do. Also helps me focus and practicing the butterfly knife also helps me keep subconscious focus as well. Dexterity skills just do that for me. So I was doing that. 
then all of a sudden this cop car comes right up behind me and this cop's like hey put your knife away and I and I flipped the knife open for him and I showed him and I'm like look this is not a knife sir this is a trainer it's like yeah well I got a couple of calls about you and I'm like is that a fact he's like yeah I got some calls about you you know you're scaring people I'm like okay well he's like I, I will I want you to put your, night, your, your, your trainer away. And I'm like, he's like, you're not doing anything illegal. And I'm like, okay, I'm not doing anything illegal, but you want me to put my trainer away. Okay, whatever. So I did, right? It was really annoying. It was really annoying. But, you know, then I actually wrote a letter to the police department actually explaining exactly what I'm doing and sending it in so that everyone understands that like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Even, even my physical therapist said I should be butterflying because it's rehabbing my shoulder and, and I actually went in for an evaluation on my shoulder recently and uh, he evaluated it and he says, you're really close. He's like, you are like 90 plus percent done with your rehab, just keep going. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll keep going. You know, and I, and I, and I have, I have uh, consistently, you know, so, with all that being said, it's like, you know, being, being UDSF, you know, being UD, it's still pretty terrifying for most people, you know, very much so. And oftentimes people jump to conclusions about UD people, especially UD ENTPs, because we just look so evil, but we're not. The reality of the situation is, is that we're actually some of the safest people to be around which is something that a lot of people don't even realize. So then when I like have contact, um, like for example, um, Flare Gun works down the street and um, she's like, oh, Chase, you're pretty cool. You're not really intimidating. I don't know why everyone says you are. I don't know why everyone has such a problem. I'm like, yeah, I know, exactly. Well, she's UD as well. She is unconscious developed. So it's like, okay. That's cool. Nice to see someone else who's unconscious developed. Very accommodating of me, right? You know, so. But she's also an ISTP and super accepting as a result. But she too is UDSF, right? You know, so she's focusing on character, integrity, identity. Theirs and others. And what I've shared with her, she's like, knows my identity and she's like, she knows my character. And it's like, oh, well, I know your character. You're actually a good person, even though everyone else just assumes that you're not a good person. Which is frustrating. Because everyone's just, you know, they're bullshit assumptions, right? So, yeah. But, ultimately, it's all about legacy. And my legacy is, you know, Andrew Tate, you know, he's dealing the same shit that I'm dealing with. His legacy was you know, a, a legacy of, you know, improving manhood, ultimately a, a legacy of, you know, down with the matrix, that whole thing, right? My legacy being getting get rid of fatherlessness, rebuilding families, preventing suicide, preventing abortion, building a new nation, ego nation, where all the men and women of this new nation are the envy of the world, basically. But it's still based on legacy. When before, when I was dying of liver failure, I was just trying to upload my legacy onto the internet, which is how this whole thing started with all you folks to begin with. So it makes a lot of sense that UDSF heart temple types are all about their body temples of conscious as a result. Then we have soul temple types, ENFP, INFJ, ESTP, ISTJ, and they're used to relying on passion and obsession of the heart temple shadows but can now journey into the mind temple subconscious where it's all about performance and learning and becoming a means to cultivate identity and refine character. This is something I should probably help Railgun with, help her get on that path and get out of her UDUF ditch that she's in consistently, which puts herself at risk and puts our son at risk and, and other people around her at risk because of that. But if she could actually learn how to get into her soul temple side, she can uh, you know, increase her performance, be all about learning 
and as a means to cultivate identity and refine character. She's just not spending enough time learning. She's not taking the notes, she's not reading the books. She's not around mentors, that's what she needs. She needs mentors. And ultimately, if you think about it, that's actually why she actually got with me initially, because she wanted to utilize me as a mentor, trying to get out of UDUF to UDSF. But ultimately, it just didn't work out. Which is understandable. But it's all, it's all from an octogram perspective. So let's talk about functional preference. So UDSF functional preference, UDSF are said to be the most successful of all the variants. Why? They seek adversity to overcome, but overcoming challenges fuels their hope. They're obsessed with improvement because of this. And, and I, am, I am constantly obsessed with improvement. The UDSF functional preference is, according to the Ego Hacking Your Fear Masterclass, ultimately the hero function and the parent function. The UDSF variant is quite literally has the most strength where they are most naturally the strongest, as the hero and the parent are their naturally strongest functions. So ultimately, the UDSF variant is the strongest variant in terms of wielding the power of their own ego, basically, which is awesome. However, however, what does that say about their aspiration? They can wield their ego really well, but they're kind of weak with their aspirational functions which is obviously their inferior function, but then also their child function, which is the guidance function that goes along with it. And that too can be problematic. So they often still lack joy and aspirations. They're constantly on this quest or this journey to find that joy, to find that aspiration, as a result of the fact that their hero function and their parent function are hyper-developed, whereas their child function and their inferior function are not as developed, basically. Lol. Anyway, the hero and the parent have this obsession with moving forward, hope. But moving forward uh, preciously and uh, cautiously, I think that's precisely actually. The UDSF is aware of the new responsibilities gained from new achievement and that hope can be given to others through their example. And that's what I try to do. Give hope to as many people as possible all the time. Even the people who harm me the most even the people that betray me. I actually was in a conversation last night with an ENTP, an 18-year-old ENTP girl, who's basically my adopted niece. She's my adopted niece, and I love her dearly, and I wish her all of the success in the world, and I go out of my way to give her as much hope as possible. But she's like asking me, like, why do you do it? Like, why, do you, why are you so compassionate to people? Why? And basically, you know, she's, she's like, well, what is family to you? And why do you care so much about producing family or the idea of family for other people? And I told her it's because I've never, I've never received family. I've never been like, I'm in family, but I've never received the concept of family. It's always been on me to produce family for others, produce family for Railgun and Kim and, uh, you know, my children and, uh, Ray Gun as well, to produce for Ray Gun. Ray Gun is the different from Rail Gun, different, different one. Produce, produce family. And I've never really been in a position to receive family. So whenever I do receive family and I'm like actually receiving family, it's like a really big deal. And she's like, well, well how, how are you even able to do it? And I had to remind her, it's like, look, the people who are hurt the most are the people who smile the most. You know, it's all about compassion at the end of the day. You know, for me, as a heart crusader, it's all about compassion. I end up being hourly compassionate to other people in the process. So to her, I told her, how did I put it? It's because I give to what I, I produce for others or I give to others what I hope to receive, basically. You know, and, and for example, that would be like, like family. I actually shared that conversation with those that are, um, um, with some people in my life uh, to that end to like, you know, drive a point home, basically. Some of my uh, closest confidants or, you know, people that I, uh, that I ultimately care about to a point or people that I'm trying to give hope to, basically. So if the UDSF is the most successful variant, it may also be because they may be closest to integration. 
Having skill in the shadow, ego, and inspiring the subconscious, three of the four sides of the mind are consistently used. They have a lot to pull from. However, the danger of the UDUSF, there is a danger though. The danger is that it's overturned optimism. The can-do energy can still fly in the face of realism and practicality. Sometimes forgetting that forcing oneself to face challenges can underwind one's own peace. The UDSF variants have a hard time actually enjoying life. Cool. True that. True that. Oftentimes I feel like I'm this king who has this table that everyone else eats at, but I myself am not able to eat at my own table. Right? That's the danger of UDSF. Hope is ultimately a future-oriented perspective. Until the UDSF learns to put some of their hope in the present, maybe I have what I need in front of me, they will always be ultimately restless. The ultimate test of hope is peace. And the UDSF must learn to enjoy the rewards of overcoming and drink of the peace of victory. Though they may feel like they have endless hope to draw from, hope too must ultimately be replenished. Now let's, uh, let's uh, discuss uh, what John Bodine wanted added to uh, this particular lecture. Let's see if I can find it on my watch as I look at our text conversation. Hopefully I can. Let's see here. Ooh, 14 texts. All right, let's see here. Uh, John. So I'm going to read you guys the uh, um, read you guys the text conversation. So he said, "I want to put something at the very end of the lecture, which is the struggle for UDSF, which I believe is peace, hope being future oriented. They have a hard time enjoying what they have, etc." And then I responded to him saying, "Because we often expect that uh, what we have will just be taken away from us, like it always has been before." And he's like, "Yeah, that's true, exactly." UDSF people are aware that at any moment they can be thrown back into UDUF. That they are close to survival mode. That once again they can have everything taken away from them and they have to go back into survival mode again after the fact. And they're always aware of that risk. It's always gnawing at them at the back of their mind consistently. Which is understandable because it always is gnawing at the back of my mind. It always is. So yeah, that's the one thing about UDSF. It's all about having peace. And it's funny because in that conversation that I was having with my adopted niece, basically telling her like, look, you know, ultimately, you know, having family where I'm able to receive family, I could finally relax. What I'm really saying is it's like, I could finally like have peace. So that's really what I'm looking for. Uh, to be able to experience enough joy so that I can finally actually be at peace. That's the difference. That's ultimately the end goal or the quest of the UDSF octogram variant. So, anyway, folks, thanks for watching and listening. And uh, I'll see you guys on the next season 18 Cognitive Mechanics where we'll be discussing UDUF uh, next month uh, for uh, September uh, 2023. See you then, folks.